Welcome to the rigid body equations of motion. Today we are going to discuss the precession of systems of charges in a magnetic field. In the case of a charge distribution, the magnetic moment has the, the following definitions. If we are talking about a collection of charged, charged particles distributed in space, the the definition is the one here, where I've written the, the summation expi explicitly over the uh, individual charges for each particle i and the, the cross product between the uh, radius vectors of each particle and their corresponding velocities. And if we are talking about a continuous charge dis distribution, the, the sum generalizes to the, the integral here, where the, the density of index E refers to electric charge density. The definition of the orbital angular momentum for such a system is quite similar. Namely, this is the definition corresponding to the case of a distribution of particles and uh, the generalization to a continuous uh, mass distribution where this time the, the density refers to the matter density, so to, to the to the to the mass density. And as we see the they, they are quite similar in structure up to the up to the nature of the involved density. So um, in this in this case we can say that the magnetic moment is proportional to the to the angular momentum of the system. So this is the case that would be of interest in the study. And the proportionality constant gamma is called the gyromagnetic ratio. So this is the, the classical expression, which is the ratio between the charge and uh, mass. But uh, more generally, it can be left unspecified as it can, uh, it can refer to systems that are not, that are not classical in nature. And the, the potential energy for the, for the interaction of such a magnetic moment with a field of magnetic induction that is assumed to be constant throughout the system is defined by the by the dot product here. And this, this assumption works in the case of point magnetic moments that are unaffected by their motion, such as small permanent magnets or systems at the subatomic scale, so including atomic. So for this can be this can apply to electrons Orbiting, orbiting nuclei and, and, and smaller systems. So the, for such a system, the torque is given by the, the cross product between the uh, magnetic moment and the magnetic induction. And if we put this result together with uh, equation 599, so with the, with the definition of the magnetic moment in terms of the orbital angular momentum, we can immediately obtain an equation of motion for the orbital angular momentum in terms of the of the cross product written here. But this is just the equation of motion of a vector of constant magnitude that is rotating about the direction of the magnetic induction with the frequency omega that is given by, by this value, so a factor of minus gamma minus the geromagnetic ratio multiplying the induction. Thus the, the effect of a uniform magnetic field on a permanent magnetic dipole is to cause the angular momentum vector and as such the magnetic moment itself to precess uniformly. And from the result of 5100, so from the definition of the classical gyromagnetic ratio, we obtain this frequency to have the value here. And this is known as the Larmor frequency. Now in the case of electrons the charge is negative and the net result is that the precession is counterclockwise about the direction of the uh, magnetic induction field. Now we can now look at the case of a system of charges all having the same ratio Q over M and situated in a, in a region of constant magnetic field. 
and we will also assume that the interaction potential depends only on relative coordinates. Then the Lagrangian of the system is uh, just the, the, the sum of the kinetic energies of all the particles plus the interactions between the, the particles and the uh, magnetic induction field which is written in terms of the of the vector potential as we've seen all the way back in all the way back in chapter one and uh, from this we subtract the the total interaction energy of the system of the, the self interaction of the system so the, the interaction between the, the particles within within it um, then for a for a field of magnetic induction a, a field of constant magnetic induction the the appropriate vector potential is the one given here and this can be evaluated immediately just by you can check this just by taking the uh, the, 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 the rotor of the expression and you will see that uh, uh, this thing becomes just the magnetic induction field and if we put these two results together the Lagrangian can then be written as uh, as seen here so the, the, the kinetic term the the interaction between the particles and the interaction of the system with the magnetic field which as you can see ends up involving the uh, the, the angular momentum of the system so if we now evaluate this term explicitly uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, of, uh, of the of the Larmor frequency we we end up with uh, we end up with this expression now this Lagrangian can be expressed in the in the body set of axes that have a common origin with the laboratory set but are rotating uniformly about the direction of the field B with some um, frequency omega L and in this case uh, distances between between charges remain unchanged but velocities change according to the formula that we have used um, many times before throughout, uh, throughout the, the last two chapters and then we can start writing out all terms accordingly so the the, the kinetic energy expressed in uh, uh, expressed in these uh, in the in this rotating frame as the expands as seen here and the the, the interaction term uh, between the, the field and the particles also expands as seen here so now we are uh, we are establishing we've written this more generally but now we are establishing that the the, the rotation frequency which interests us is in fact the the, the Larmor frequency and what you see when when performing this this expansion what you see is that the linear terms in the Larmor frequency and in the velocity of the particles in the rotating frame cancel out well if you evaluate the, the quadratic term uh, what you get is simply the, the the rotational energy that comes from the fact that when when you're looking at the system from this rotating frame it, it appears that the, the system itself is rotating so you end up with this uh, additional contribution to the energy um, so then in terms of the coordinates relative uh, to the rotating system the Lagrangian simplifies to the to the expression here where we see that all of the linear terms in the magnetic induction have vanished. Um, we can consider now an electron revolving about a nucleus with some frequency omega. If the system is close to spherical symmetry then the kinetic energy is approximately this, this scalar while the dot product between the Larmor frequency and the angular momentum is approximately given by this, by this value so the what happens is that the quadratic term in this expression is of the order omega l divided by omega squared compared to the kinetic energy and of the order omega l to divided by omega compared to the to the linear term the the reason why 
um, these um, these orders of, of magnitude are relevant is due to the fact that in generally in subatomic systems the natural frequencies of the motion are far larger than the Larmor frequency. So for such systems the motion in the rotating system is the same as in the laboratory system when no magnetic field is present. And this is known as Larmor's theorem, namely that to first order in the magnetic induction the effect of a constant magnetic field on a classical system is to superimpose to its normal motion a uniform precession with angular frequency uh, omega l, the, the, the Larmor frequency. And with this in mind, we can look at the problem of the charged symmetrical top having a constant ratio gamma given by q over m for each element of mass. If the body rotates in a uniform magnetic field, then its Lagrangian will be given by the kinetic energy minus the dot product between the Larmor frequency and the angular momentum. And we would like to find the constants of motion, the frequencies and amplitudes of notation and precession in the particular case where the Larmor frequency is much smaller than the original spin velocity about the figure axis of the top and we would also like to see from where the energy for these these additional forms of motion is uh, is provided. To to go about this, we begin from the definition of the Lagrangian. So we just want to immediately show the the equivalence of what is given here, with the with the general definition. But it's it's quite obvious. So. The Lagrangian is T minus V. We write the kinetic energy in the uh, body body frame attached to the to the to the spinning charge top. So it is just the expression here, and the the definition of uh, the potential en energy that we've established is the dot product between the magnetic moment and the field of magnetic induction, and the magnetic moment itself is proportionate to uh, the the orbital angular momentum through the gyromagnetic ratio. And we are also going to assume that the magnetic induction in the laboratory frame is parallel with the z-axis. So with, with these definitions and assumptions, the Lagrangian should expand as, um, as seen here. And um, we immediately observe that this, this function is independent of the angles phi and psi. So the corresponding conjugate generalized momenta are conserved and we parameterize them just in the case of, as in the case of the heavy symmetrical top with uh, two constants b and b and a furthermore if we look at the definition of the energy function and we write it down explicitly for the for the system uh, it, it turns out that the, the, the energy function is just the, the kinetic energy. And because the, the Lagrangian that we've written here does not explicitly depend on time, uh, as we've established in chapter 2, this energy function is conserved. So the, correspondingly, the, the kinetic energy of the rotating charge top is conserved. Now, this is a statement uh, of the fact that magnetic forces do not work on moving charges. But it, apparently it also leads to a, a strange conclusion, because with, with this definition of the potential energy, it would imply that the quantity given by T plus V, this, this thing is not conserved. And this is in fact true, Th this quantity is not conserved, but at the same time this quantity does not represent the total energy of the system. And this is because something very profound happens here which goes beyond the, the scope of this discussion and generally it goes beyond the scope of, of classical mechanics. Uh, namely, when the charge top moves under the influence of the magnetic field as, as its magnetic moment aligns with the direction of the magnetic induction 
we have a we speak of a transient regime during which what we observe are moving charges and these moving charges are going to create their own time dependent electromagnetic fields through electromagnetic induction and these fields will dissipate in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So in fact, the, the energy of the system is indeed conserved, but in order to see that we also need to take into account the, the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction and the r radiation of energy through the emission of electromagnetic waves which hopefully we'll, we'll get to do in the, in the, in the distant future as, as of now. But um, for the time being, we will, we will concentrate on the, on the, on the other tasks uh, that we've, uh, we've set out for ourselves for this discussion. So we, we've established what the conserved quantities are these two so the, the angular momentum about the, the figure axis of the of the charge top and the angular momentum about the, the laboratory axis and the, the kinetic energy now since the angular momentum about the figure axis is conserved uh, this is equivalent with the statement given here and now if we use the we you, we use the approximation that the Larmor frequency is much smaller than the, the original spin frequency, uh, we can say that the, this component, so the, the angular velocity about the figure axis, is approximately conserved and is proportional with the, with the constant a. Furthermore, from the, from the conservation of the angular momentum about the z-axis in the laboratory system, we find this equation of motion for the for the precession rate of the of the charge top, which is quite similar with, with what we have obtained when we discussed the heavy symmetrical top in a uniform gravitational field, but it is a bit more general because it contains this uh, additional term in the form of the Larmor frequency. And um, in fact, what you see here is just a uh, this is a case of, of uh, really a case of Larmor's theorem that we've we've. We've previously discussed, and in analogy with the with the case of the heavy symmetrical top, um, we can uh, define a constant alpha uh, given by the expression here. But it does not contain the the total energy of the system as we uh, uh, in in, our, in in the set of assumptions that we work with here. We do not even know how to write the total energy, but it contains. The, the kinetic energy which is separately conserved and in terms of this constant we can by complete analogy with the case of the heavy symmetrical top we can write an equation of motion for the for the angle theta furthermore since the the original precision rate so at, at the moment when the when the field is turned on uh, this value is zero um, we can write down a a, we can write down the constant b. F f through this result, we can write down the uh, the constant b in terms of the constant a and the original inclination of the figure axis of the top with respect to the uh, to the z axis in the, in the laboratory frame. So what happens now is um, that we can. We can treat this equation of motion by by analogy with the case of uh, of the heavy symmetrical top or the the discussion of the equivalent uh, one one dimensional motion in the in the central force problem, and we end up with the with the function f of u or the squared time derivative of u, where u is just the cosine of theta, having the the expansion here, so it ends up being uh, a fair bit more complicated than in the in the case of the heavy symmetrical top. It, it contains a a term of the fourth power of u. It contains several new terms involving the, the Larmor frequency. But due to the fact that this the Larmor frequency is assumed to be much smaller 
than the original spin frequency and consequently is much smaller than the constant a, we can neglect many, many of these terms, including in particular this term as it, since it's multiplied by the square of the karma frequency, that this ends up being, this contribution is in fact much smaller than the cubic term and we can, we can neglect it. So by, by neglecting the small terms, the quantity is approximately given by the by the smaller expansion here. And one further approximation that we can make is that alpha itself is a very small quantity. Because you see what we are doing when we define alpha, we are subtracting from the total kinetic energy the the, the, the spin motion of the top, which is by far the, the dominant contribution. So the, the kinetic energy corresponding to uh, notation about the the z axis and precession about it are are much smaller than the than the the, the 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 spin energy so we are left with a very small quantity here which we we neglect and then the uh, this contracts further to the expression here and if we identify the, this product with beta that this is in fact completely analogous to the to the case of the of the heavy symmetrical top which starts from starts moving from essentially starts moving from rest so it, it was only rotating about its uh, spin axis when we release it in a, in a uniform gravitational field so we we immediately know the the solutions of this equation and Right, so it's the same expression as 567 and as such we can identify immediately the the extent of notation just as uh, as per the formula given there and the precession rate uh, uh, corresponding to it uh, and these are both given in terms of the um, of the Larmor frequency of the original inclination of the top with respect to the laboratory axis and um, uh, in terms of the, the constant A which is just the ratio of the principal moments of inertia of the top and its initial spin frequency. And what we can see in both cases is that the energy for precession and notation is provided by the interaction between the spinning charges and the, and the magnetic field. And this is seen in the fact that both both quantities, uh, both quantities are non-vanishing simply because the Larmor frequency is non-vanishing. So the, the, the there there is a non-zero field of magnetic induction in the in the space where these where these charges are rotating. In summary, we have discussed the motion of systems of charges in uh, uniform magnetic fields, emphasizing the Larmor precession Larmor theorem. And we have treated the particular case of a charged symmetrical top in a uniform magnetic field, where we have obtained solutions analogous to those of a heavy symmetrical top in a uniform gravitational field. This concludes our discussion of, uh, of rigid body motion, which has extended over the, over the last two chapters. And in the, in the next chapter, we are going to discuss the, another class of important problems in classical mechanics which um, is related to the to the phenomenon of uh, oscillations i want to thank you very much for watching and i hope you found this discussion worth your time then the the best possible way to conclude uh, the, the 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 subject here is through the uh, through the verses of uh, Dorothy Lake Sears. Uh, she was a, uh, a writer, uh, poet, and a scholar of the first half of the, of the 20th century. And these words are from one of her mystery novels. I believe it was called The Gordy Nights, and it was written sometime around 1935. And I will, I will at her words speak for themselves and I will catch you later. Goodbye.